Our Chrononauts, a science fiction literature history podcast, and this is our host choice episode where we are discussing a bunch of non-English works, and now it's my turn to introduce Renato Pestroniero. He is our author tonight, born in Venice in 1933. However, it's important to clarify that while Pestroniero himself is not much known in the English-speaking world, and Italian science fiction in general has not only been neglected abroad, but perhaps faced certain challenges at home for many decades that meant it didn't develop much of a basis as a genre until the second half of the 20th century. Pesto Minero, though, doesn't exist in a vacuum, and there were antecedents to what he was doing. Have you guys read any previous science fiction works from Italy or Italian authors? No, I don't, I don't think so. Yeah, not that I can think of. The only Italian stuff I've read has been, like, I guess I read The Betrothed, which is historical fiction, mm -hmm. and I guess Dante, um, you know, probably yeah. some other Renaissance and stuff Echo. I'm blanking on. Right, yeah, I yeah, guess Umberto yeah. Eco, yeah. Foucault's Pendulum, which is awesome, but not really science fiction. But it's probably not really science fiction, yeah. although it certainly has traces of it in its woven into its narrative, as do a lot of the works of Calvino, I think. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, I've read one book previously, Terra by Stefano Benny, and it reminded me a bit of Douglas Adams at The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I, I feel like it was kind of in that style a little bit. I was pretty young when I read it, so I don't remember too many details, but I really liked it at that time. So, I don't know how it would hold up for me now. I also read a Another story that I don't know the name of and don't have enough info to go on, so I wasn't able to find it, but it was in an anthology that I read when I was like nine, and it was like this first contact story of a bunch of humans from different countries who had all traveled on a ship to, I don't know if it was Mars or some farther, further away planet, and they encountered an alien, and of course they were terrified because it looked like a monster, and they were going to shoot it, but then they had this kind of epiphany where they realized that the alien also realized at the same time that each of them was terrified of the other, and right. like that was the only reason why they were being aggressive and crappy, and so if they just kind of got over that, maybe they could get along, and it was nice. <laughs> but it was probably geared a little bit towards children, and I think that's sort of a trend in definitely a lot of the stuff that we see in Italian SF for a while. But according to Ariel Saber in her article, Flying Saucers Would Never Land in Luca, the fiction of Italian science fiction being the subtitle in the Journal of California Italian Studies, Italian science fiction faced challenges. Adherence to a classical tradition, this is somewhat vouched for by Pestro Nero, 19th century leftist intellectuals, wary of capitalism and anything seemed to be American, an early 20th century focus on hyper-realism in writing, and the Roman Catholic Church, which loomed large in influence and power in this country right up till recent times, and pretty much had an implicit focus on illegitimate prophecies being dangerous and not, not fit for right-thinking people. So, how serious these challenges really were, it's difficult to say from my perspective, but it certainly did make for publication difficulties for Italian writers, as even when science fiction did start to become recognized in Italy, the preference was slanted very much toward publishing reprints of American, British, and perhaps some French works. So, again, I'm going to say a lot of things in English, because I don't really know Italian, I think might be better at pronouncing it than 
a few other languages, but still, I don't really know it, so I'm going to try to avoid butchering too many things, but we'll see how it goes going forward. But I just want to talk a bit about, yeah, I'm mostly unfamiliar with Italian literature as a whole, and I certainly don't see too many Italian names among the noted science fiction practitioners. I don't believe in any of the reference works we've collected that are like encyclopedic in nature in some fashion. You can find many Italian authors listed, maybe in the film category though. And I'm somewhat more familiar with some of the science fiction films that started coming out around the 1960s. Stuff like Wild Planet by Antonio Margariti, and Assignment Outer Space, The Tenth Victim, which is based on a story by Robert Sheckley, and of course Planet of the Vampires which is the adaptation of tonight's story. But it doesn't look like there was much in the way of serious SF scholarship in Italy before 2011. And both the contributors to the Online Science Fiction Encyclopedia's Italy section and the Global Science Fiction Studies book on Italian science fiction written mostly by Simone Brioni and Daniel Combrigliati point out that the established wide gap between literary and scientific language that's traditionally existed in Italy also does its part to stunt perhaps the development of science fiction itself. In the later half of the 19th century, the works of Wells, Byrne, and Edward Bellamy were translated into Italian. At home, there were certainly important scientific developments including Schiarapelli and his telescopic observations of Mars, which we discussed in an earlier episode of Chrononauts. Yeah, there's a fair amount of major Italian developments in electrical technologies, too. I mean, Galvani yeah. and Volta mm -hmm. around 1800 right, right. both revolutionized the entire right. industry with the development of a primitive battery from Volta and Galvani's observations on the relationship between electricity and the body, you know, how electricity moves muscles and things like that. Yeah, so I think it's quite interesting. I mean, you would almost think that in that kind of climate, these kind of stories would flourish, but it seems not. It seems there's a very strong divide between literary and scientific worlds in Italy, so. Yeah, the early examples that were noted by the science fiction encyclopedia, I couldn't find original text of online anywhere, so I'd imagine even within Italy, there's still probably not that well-known or fairly obscure and hard to find. Oh, okay. Well, we might get to some of those. I don't know which ones you looked for, but uh, you can tell me as we go, I guess. Yeah, I looked for Graffoni's From Earth to the Stars or something like that. Okay, yeah. And I, yeah, there's no luck finding it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, interesting. Yeah, they, they, they seem to be quite scarce, and there certainly don't seem to be a lot of easily available English translations of either... 19th or many 20th century works, even. So. Right. But before 1861, Italy was not a unified nation, and many early works in the country projected a future of a unified Italian state. The first book that Brioni and Comberiati mentioned from this period is Ippolito Nievo's Philosophical History of the Future Centuries Until the Year 2222, or The Wake of the End of the World. And of course, that's my English red ring of the title, because I'm not going to say the long Italian title. But I will say the names of a few magazines and things like that if I can. But this was in 1860, and in the 1860s and 70s, there were a few future histories, moon journey stories, and other such things, including a short book attributed to Carlo Rossi and entitled A Beach Guardian, which had the subtitle A Free Translation of the Battle of Dorking, and... In it was, it was France invading Italy and coming onto Italian shores and sacking the towns. And it ends with an exhortation to beef up the fleet. So <laughs> right. I guess that's pretty cool. He says they do a very, just a free translation of somebody else's book. And you can just pretty much rip the whole thing off and set it in a different country. And <laughs> it'd be fine. <laughs> just kind of interesting because we did kind of talk about this during our Battle of Dorking segment last year and how influential that really was and yeah we talked about some of the german ripoffs and yeah there were italian ripoffs too so yeah and the italian ripoff tradition 
carries well into the 20th century with the glut of low-grade rip-off films of various franchises like oh yeah um, road warrior and and it's interesting how all this all ties together yeah pester nero story is very short so it's worth getting into some of where this background came from i guess so as soon as italy had gained its independence as kind of there were independent states at the time but most of what's now italy was under the control of the austrian empire so but as soon as Italy attained a certain level of economic freedom. The idea of pursuing its own colonial aims popped into the nation's head very quickly. And science fiction stories were published in magazines like Giornale Illustrato di Viaggio della Aventura de Terra e de Mare, which translates to an illustrated journal of travels and adventures of the earth and the sea. And alongside accounts of game hunting expeditions in Africa and so on, much of the SF there was evidence of the expressed colonialist sentiments. And perhaps unsurprisingly, according to Brioni and Camberiati, who really stressed this angle pretty hard. So there's also descriptions of barbaric foreign peoples and their ways of life. Non-Europeans mostly, especially Africans and island people. And so... Right away, you think of the Bondo films from the 1960s, right? Right. That's a huge thing in Italy. And it seems like Italy... I mean, this was a huge thing everywhere in Europe, these kind of stories. But it seems like Italy particularly was attracted to them. And I don't know if it's because of its position in the world and on the sea and stuff. But I don't know. It just seems like, indeed, tales of cannibalism were even pretty common. So... We wonder why the Italian film industry in the 70s and so on was so weird that <laughs> <laughs> this obsession with foreign travels and contacts with strange lands and peoples seemed to be traced back to the publication of Marco Polo's Milione, literally million, as in the number of stories that the book purports to contain of people and experiences. And this was translated into English as the most noble and famous travels of Marco Polo, almost 400 years later, around 1579, and was one of the big inspirations for Italo Calvino's Invisible Cities in 1972, where he, haven't read this, but uh, he's supposed to directly reference and play with that text. And it does sound pretty interesting, according to the composers of the Italian article in SFE, it really does read like a first contact story where the, the, these Italians are going to the eastern lands and trying to bargain with and do make understandings with the cultures there and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's kind of, uh, I'd actually be curious to see what that's like. I wonder mm -hmm. if it compares to some of the old historical classical works like Herodotus and stuff like that almost. Mm -hmm. uh, it'd be interesting to take a look at that. I, I'm definitely not well versed in this kind of thing but i definitely you know it kind of brought me back to first hearing about marco polo and, and getting into that doctor who story when i was younger and, yeah right oh yeah. that's really interesting and like you know what happened i'll find out what to find out about him and getting my dad to look it up in the encyclopedia <laughs> and stuff and like, <laughs> so yeah and especially after reading if on a winter's night a traveler a few months ago i would love to read more calvino yeah yeah, yeah, you play an authentic account of this 12th century journeys. There's certainly no shortage of vaguely science fiction-esque fantastic journey stories, such as the 1516 epic poem Orlando Furioso by Ludovico Ariosto. Mm -hmm. And in this, a knight journeys to a dark wizard's palace on the moon by way of riding a giant hippogriff, which... E.R. Edison seems to have cribbed for the Worm Ouroboros in 1922, where the dreamer character of his Lessingham falls asleep in a chamber full of lotus blossoms and gets borne aloft to Mercury on the back of a similar beast to witness a vast play of world-shattering intrigues and battles. And, of course, there were many utopias as well in the 17th century, and in the 18th, picaresque travel foreign works like Gulliver's Travels and Voltaire's Candide are supposed to have been extremely popular. And there were, of course, a number of pastiches or tributes or imaginative pieces that use 
these for a springboard. One of which I will note because it has the entertaining title, Enrico Wanton's Travels to the Unknown Lands of the Southern Hemisphere and to the Kingdoms of the Monkeys and the Dog-Headed People by yeah, Zacharia Sariman. And if you're wondering why that doesn't sound like an Italian name, apparently he was an Armenian, so it's interesting. But the last one to mention from this time period is undoubtedly the colossal work by Giacomo Casanova, which we did mention in our Hollow Earth episode. Right. Written in French in 1787, equals Amaron, where a brother and sister discover a vast underground world inhabited by, in a similar perhaps mode as Voltaire, the Megamikri. And much of this five-volume epic is spent meticulously describing everything from their governmental systems to their scientific and philosophical principles and their wonderful inventions and they're harnessing a force that allows them to move heavy vehicles without animals. And I don't know, it sounds cool, but it also sounds like it goes on and on and on. Like just picturing um, 5,000 pages or something of like. Yeah. Apparently it's really long. So. Yeah. I was never able to find a complete translation of it in English. I was only able to find like an abridged translation. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Uh, all so, the English translations seem to be abridged, and yeah. I, I guess, you know, it's <laughs> one of those things. No one wants to put all of the effort into translating such a such a yeah. long narrative. Casanova was known for many things, but writer of science <laughs> right. fiction novels, not really a moment, yeah. I guess. So. But now we come to the 19th century, and we have to point out that although there were certainly a few tales involving automata and dream journeys into the future and such, there was really no Italian equivalent of Poe, Hawthorne, Mary Shelley, Verne, or Wells. And I think we can all agree that these, all these figures are in their way real turning points in what science fiction would become and taking it away from the admittedly interesting but sort of primitive I don't know, like, just travel to a foreign land and either enact conquest or just watch everything that's going on kind of stories. Yes. And Orlando Furioso does sound interesting. That is one of those stories we didn't cover during episode one, and maybe we'll have an interest in coming to it at some point when we do another one of these diversions. But yeah, for the most part, those obscurities and weird curiosities from before 1800 are probably not worth getting that much into. At least all the descriptions of those hollow earth novels and weird political satires and moon voyages just seem like all the other ones. Like they're yeah. kind of, you read one, you read them all in a sense. Mm -hmm. But Right, like when you read it, yeah, exactly. And I think after Erewhon, I think we can take a long break. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, been there, done that. Yeah. But now that we've turned the clock way back, let's yank it back uh, unceremoniously and unskillfully to the early 20th century and the Giornale Illustrato. So although the quality of the tales I can't really speak for, and it sounds like some of them probably weren't that great, again, the striking nature of many of the illustrations are pointed out by Brioni and Kind of, you know, in a case that may be similar to Orchid Garden, in that a lot of the stories are also translated, and perhaps not that well, and probably a few original stories, but yeah, some really cool pictures. There's a striking image of an Italian flag on Venus and stuff like that. And, and we get some important works from the 19th century, like Apollo Mantegazza's Anno 3000, Sonio. He was a physician, politician, and writer who traveled extensively and was a big supporter of Italian colonial efforts in Africa, as well as racial hierarchy theories. So his 1897 book was highly influenced by travel narratives as well, and was written as a response to Bellamy's Looking Backward. And it sounds a pretty unpleasant book. There's also Emilio Salgari, who published a lot of stuff in the magazines, and he was a writer of futuristic stories like The Marvels of the Year 2000, 20,000 Leagues Under America, <laughs> The Conquest of the Moon, and King of the Air. And there's also Yambo, who composed that Explorers of Infinity, mate that you were mentioning earlier. Mm -hmm. I think, um, did you call it something? Do you know it as a different title? Of course, these are English renderings. Uh, but I think that's the one you were talking about, the space opera that you couldn't find. Yeah, it was From Earth to the Stars by Ulysses Griffoni. 
from 1887. Oh, okay. Uh, it's a different. This is a, okay. See, that's a different one I'm thinking of. So yeah, like sometimes it's hard to keep these words straight. But Yambo, who wrote this in 1906, Explorers of Infinity, is also the director of the what's known anyway as the first Italian science fiction film in 1910, An Interplanetary Marriage. And of course, we can't complete the discussion of Italian science fiction completely without the mention of the Futurists and their movement in the 1910s and 1920s. Right. Mm. And Mafarca the Futurist, an African novel, was 1909, and it's by Filippo Tommaso Marinetti. And, well, I read a couple of synopses of this book because it sounded really far out and wild, and it's mentioned in both the Cambridge History of Science Fiction and, of course, in the Italian as a book. And, well... <sighs> It's like Future Eve by Leela Dom, taken up to 100, basically, including the misogyny. I don't think we're ever going to do this book on the podcast. It's really, really next-level stuff. Basically, this it's supposed to be set in Africa, and it's supposed to be about African people, but, like, none of that's ever really gone into. Like, they could be anybody, almost. Like, there's no real sense of place or geography, and I think for... Marinetti and perhaps some of his predecessors, you know, Africa is just this, like, other place where you can set their stories and have... It's really interesting because, you know, there's kind of this double think involved where it's like, yeah, this is about this African chief who develops a Superman, basically, and he does this without the intervention of women, which is something that he's very happy about, and... When this creature is born, it immediately starts growing, and it grows so tall that it, like, basically, its head is, like, in the clouds, and it's, it's like, this, it starts flying around, and, and I don't know, it's, it's, it sounds really, really weird, <laughs> really wild, but the Futurists, under the auspices of people like Marinetti, pretty much blossom into outright fascism, but it was also the first concrete avant-garde movement to emerge in Italy. And the Futurists were obsessed with machines, and Marinetti's buddies included authors, artists, and film directors, among them Alessandro Vorano, who reputedly brought the crime genre to Italy and published tales under the Libri Gialli range starting in 1930, which is the famous Giallo books with the yellow covers. Right, yeah. And the group called themselves EDS, or EDC, I guess that would be, the Ten, and they would be known now as the Italian Futurist Movement. But they were basically a literary collective, and I don't know if that's really ironic, considering that many of them were fascists, but they definitely seem to have a kind of a real double-think kind of thing going on, which you kind of recognize in some fascist movements today, where they pretend to be about something else. Right. And they got a lot of attention, including from abroad, and they were able to publish novels and anthologies, and... They made a collaborative book, which sounds like a lot of fun, actually. It's called The Tsar is Not Dead. It sounds a lot like The Angel of the Revolution, but from a pro-monarchy, like intensely pro-monarchy perspective. And each chapter was written by a different member of the group. And they were playing all these games with it, and they had a contest to see if people could guess who wrote each chapter of the book. And I don't remember if it was in this book or in the anthology that they published, which is basically a whole bunch of short stories, some of which are sort of science fictional in nature, apparently. But they had a preface, and they explained their aims, and they had many goals, but their most stated openly goal was to increase the price of books in Italy to return some of that value, aka time, to the artist. And it was a big deal. They said that all these men in Idiachi were different from one another and cooperating in solidarity in this, they said. But it's pretty clear when you read their books and also in the preface to The Tsar is Not Dead, they kind of also state that they have no political aims and they just want to tell a really fun adventure story and that you should all just relax and enjoy it. And then they proceed to tell this like immensely reactionary like pro monarch work and you know it's like they might be right in some ways to make the massacre of the Tsar's family like look like the most horrible thing in creation i don't know it's just really interesting it gave me the angel of the revolution vibes and but yeah i don't know like those guys pretty much 
went silent after the Second World War or didn't survive. But obviously they've had an influence and there were quite a few men involved in different walks of life. But Marinetti especially seems like quite an asshole. <laughs> but comic books really took off in the 30s. And Superman was really popular. It was new in America at the time. But there were also Italian creations. And they were pretty solidly aimed at a juvenile audience. So the magazine L'Aventuroso, or The Adventurer, was also a thing. And here we have a reverse of the leader experience where anglicized or French names were Italianized to please the fascist censors who, of course, wanted patriotism. And this is kind of a fun contrast to what would happen later, I guess, where they would do the opposite thing. But it seems like hiding your identity as a science fiction writer in Italy was very important, or maybe as a director of horror films. Yeah. Mm. Not much was happening in the 40s, though. World War II took a lot out of the nation, and science fiction was kind of considered an Anglo-American thing. Hence the publication of all these translated works and writers like Touch and Nero having trouble getting stuff out there. In a highly political time, science fiction was not respected by either the right or the left. And it was called Fantascienza in Italy. This term was first coined by Giorgio Monicelli, a translator, French and English, who created the magazine Urania, Adventures in Space and Time, in 1952. And this was done for the Montadori Publication Group, and they were the same group that published the Gialli Libri. So again, we have all these things tied together, which is pretty interesting. He was an avid reader of American popes, basically from the 1930s onward. And unfortunately, the magazine Urania only lasted for 14 issues, but it published short stories mostly translated from English magazines, like especially Galaxy Magazine, which was new at that time, started in 1950, and definitely was the sort of social-political satire side of science fiction being expressed in full force, and certainly something that I'm looking forward to talking about more as we get into the 1950s. But Definitely, yeah. Yeah. But they also published scientific articles and, of course, pieces about exotic lands and customs, though here apparently presented in a somewhat more scientific and less lurid way. And interestingly, though, along with the magazine, there was a series of novels that accompanied it, and it was sold exclusively on newsstands and was extremely successful in contrast to the magazine. And the series of novels lasted for years, eventually itself taking on the collective name of Urania. And of the first 267 issued novels, only 11 of them were Italian. Mostly they were translated works of people like Arthur C. Clarke, Robert A. Heinlein, John Wyndham, Clifford D. Simic, and Jack Williamson. And although a few were apparently French, but now that we're in the 50s, of course, and the Patriots are no longer in power, we acknowledge the American nature of science fiction, and suddenly all the Italian names, too, are being anglicized. And there were several Italian writers that I haven't heard of from around this time, including at least three prominent women. And the only name I recognized was Ernesto Gastaldi, who is a screenwriter. Definitely seen his name on many credits for Italian films. Uh, but he wrote under the pseudonym Julian Barry. And in 1957, Monicelli had a dispute with his publisher and started his own competitor series, Romani di Cosmo, and these seemed to feature more Italian authors. And by the late 50s, some other magazines had sprung up, some of which also tended to look for more original material. And some of the writers even published under their own names. This pretty much takes us to our subject, Renato Pastorinero, who was a young writer when this story was published in 1960. And he's still around, and pretty much writing up to the 2000s. And in the 60s, though, I mean, the new wave writers did sort of get translated, and Italian audiences get exposed to people like Samuel Delaney and Roger Zelazny. But as you might expect, these didn't sell as well as stuff like Urania had, their contents being more experimental and kind of going over the heads of most of the general public. So 
I think we'll end the general Italian background here, although the science fiction encyclopedia mentions a number of authors from the 1960s that definitely sound like they might be worth a look someday on Chrononauts, and sure. we'll have to see how much of this stuff has actually been translated into English. Una notte di... You know what? I'll just say it in English because I don't know how to say 21 in Italian, but... <laughs> A Night of 21 Hours was published in issue 61 of Ultra Il Cielo, or Beyond the Sky. And it was also in the anthology Interplanetary 3 in 1963, which is where the film director, Mario Baba, seems to have read it. And the magazine was, again, both devoted to science and tech and fiction. And it kept going till 1970 and produced 155 issues. For a long time, writing science fiction was a hobby for Pester Nero and not his full-time career. He said he spent much of his free time writing stories. And he also complained about the difficulty for Italian writers in the genre to get published. They only wanted translations from English, it seems. That said, I think he does underestimate some of the psychological qualities of the stories published in English in the 40s and 50s. Maybe he didn't read that much of it, or maybe he was, you know, only exposed to certain kinds. Who knows, right? But And he likes to compare his stuff more to J.G. Ballard and his discussion of the mental states of astronauts that would start coming up a few years later. But he unknowingly says something very similar to a quote from Jack Williamson that I believe I referenced in our amazing episode. I'm more and more convinced that science fiction, particularly social science fiction, is the best way to investigate and reflect on any moral, ethical, religious, political, and psychological situation of the common man, today and tomorrow. His difficulties in facing and overcoming the gaps between his knowledge, his normal way of life, and the negative sides of technological fallout. So... Finally, Pastor Nero did get some recognition. The commemoration on his 75th birthday in Venice at the 2008 Venetian Literary Conference. But he was born in Venice in 1933, and he appears to have stayed there most of his life. And while he was writing stories, he worked for a company, some kind of multinational Swiss company. <laughs> Sounds fishy to me. <laughs> but... He published a lot of short stories, and apparently close to 150, and yeah. Yeah, several novels, and many nonfiction works and essays. He published his first SF story in 1958, while he was doing military service, and he said he specialized in aviation. Certainly the titles of Pestinero's novels sound pretty great. Uh, it still seems, though, like this story and the Baba adaptation is one of the most widely cited things movie is shown a lot at various, I guess, representation of the best Italian SF had to offer at that time. Yeah. He started publishing the stories in Ultra Il Cielo, and he used the pseudonym Pi Air at first, not knowing how his stories would be received, and probably maybe cautious about his job, too, like, more or something. Another thing he's noted for is a collaboration with A.E. Van Boeck, who I mentioned earlier, but I don't know that it's a true collaboration. It's, I think, an expansion of his short story, The Enchanted Village, which was published in the 40s. And it sounds like he just sort of kept the Van Boeck story and added a lot to it. And this is a pretty common thing in the 90s. Silverberg did this with Asimov at least once or twice, and... I think some other writers have done that kind of thing as well, but it's still kind of cool. I really like Van Vogt, as I think we will discuss fairly soon on the podcast, maybe in a few months. Definitely has his faults, but a really interesting, especially 40s writer. So mm -hmm. 
Looks like he's also somewhat famous for a travel book about Venice with Neil Watson doing the illustration, I guess photography, searching for Venice, so... I don't know. He doesn't seem like a lot of the stuff's been translated into English. This particular story was only translated once before, I believe, and it's a very rare print publication, not digitized. Uh, or is it digitized? I don't think so. I mean, if it was, we I wouldn't have done the translation. From what I can tell is a fanzine type thing, at least that's how it looked when right. I saw a cover and maybe a page inside on ISFTB. The guy who did the initial translation also seemed to publish translations of a couple Dutch language science fiction stories. But again, it looks like a fanzine type of deal. So I'm not sure how widely it was circulated. Well, in this time, Ultra Il Cielo was bi-monthly. So this was in the first of two issues from June 1960. So we all knew the movie beforehand. Right. <laughs> yes. What do we all think of this one? I thought this was a pretty cool, especially when contrasted with the film. I mean, we'll we'll get to that when we talk about the actual story itself and what the film does with it. But it expands on different elements that aren't really present in the film that I think make more sense in the context of it. The issue of, I guess, the true nature of one's mind, you know, the ego versus mm -hmm. the id is gone into a lot here. Yeah. And it kind of adds a cool touch to the story in addition yeah. to all the cool atmosphere that we get in the story of being on this strange planet filled with a dense thick fog and everything is like purple and pinkish and it's all spooky and stuff that that stuff is all here too and that's great but yeah the psychological focus i think is an interesting one <laughs> yeah i agree with that i do like the concept of like the id versus ego as well yeah, like it still has the atmosphere that you get from the film. It's just that there's a bit of a different concept that I I enjoy for almost as much. And I think that it's really cool. Yeah, the story definitely tries to be more psychological. I don't really know that it entirely, like, again, it's pretty short. It almost feels like just as it, it sort of gets going, it ends. But also, <laughs> I like the way it works. Like, it feels... Yeah. Yeah. Very self-contained and very nightmarish and kind of, like, absurd, almost. Like, yeah. in a way that the, the film isn't. The film went through so many different writers. I think, like, maybe Baba wanted to start off with more of this concept, but it ended up turning into, like, an alien possession kind of thing. Mm -hmm. That's not here. And I, I didn't know that. I mean, it feels like that's where it's going for the first majority of it, and it's not that at all. Right. And, yeah. It's it's kind of interesting the way he deals with it. Like, it's equally nightmarish in a way, and mm. it's over with very quickly. Yeah. Yeah, I, I kind of enjoy the abrupt ending. Like, it feels pretty yeah. appropriate. Yeah, it's pretty final, and there's not much of a struggle from our heroes. Yeah. Right. There's not really a lot they can do. Like, they get, what are they going to do? Never sleep? It's like... <laughs> 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 so... Yeah, the hopelessness takes a lot quicker to set in than it did on the Aniara, that's for sure. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I do like the directions that the film goes and definitely cranks up the horror aspect and captures a lot of the physical beats from the story. Yeah. Mm. But just takes it in a different direction. Yeah, I like this one a lot. It definitely, I think, for what it's doing, you know, I'm kind of of two minds. Like, I almost say, okay, yeah, it feels like just as it was getting really interesting and getting going, it ends. But at the same time, I like that. Like, it, it somehow works here in a way that the last Arielski didn't quite. Because with that one, it was more a matter of, well, there's so many things to talk about and so many things to get into that there's no time for any of them. <laughs> Where here, it's more like it leaves you wanting more, but it also feels like dreamlike. Yeah. It feels like things just went from bad to worse and now you're waking up and mm -hmm. you're left with this awful awful but kind of absurd vision i mean i don't want to we'll get to it when we get to the end it's a very short story so i think i'll just go through it now yeah i do want to say that comparing it to the arielski mm -hmm. the arielski it's the kind of leaves you wanting more in a way that 
isn't as positive, but I think here that's uh, more effective. It it's a good thing that it leaves you wanting more in a way. Yeah, yeah. There is there's definitely a difference between those two ideas, and to be left wanting more is a good thing, in theory, yeah. unless it's a bad thing. Right, like in a, <laughs> the, the line is yeah. perhaps not that clear, and maybe some people wouldn't agree. I mean, I have a friend who constantly argues with me about this because she prefers the way modern films do like remakes of stories because they tend to explain a lot more and get into the origin of things, and that's what she likes. She wants to see that. Whereas I kind of prefer a lot of things being a little bit sketchier. So, that, I don't know. I mean, I don't know that one is necessarily better than the other, but it's just it's an interesting way of doing things. Like, I wonder if somebody could make a neat episode of, like, an anthology series or something that's, like, closer to what this is than the film. Yeah, I mean, this is an interesting example of wanting more and how the stories convey information is there's not, like, a lot of character development here or any plot actions. I had just rewatched the film today and just making some notes on it there's just so much more events in the film conflict yeah. between the characters and objectives for the characters to accomplish and things like that that just really aren't present in the story at all the yeah. story just like weird stuff happens and it's weird and there's vibes and stuff like that but yeah. as far as actual plot elements or defined characters or conflict between the people you don't really get a lot of that here and it's cool how that unfolds because the story is so short. So I think it can get away with that just kind of being this strange feeling that you get. Yeah. Right. And you do need those kind of extra movements and developments for a popular film. And right. That was one of the things mm -hmm. that what I think is really interesting to see how the story went from story by Pesero Nero, who got paid 125 uh, the equivalent of $125 to have the story made into a film. <laughs> he said he was invited to Rome to witness the production, but the check he had gotten weren't even enough to cover his <laughs> travel expenses. So <laughs> it's, like, it's not a terribly short journey from Venice to Rome, I think. So yeah, I think one of the interesting things is seeing how the writing developed and like it changed a lot of hands. And the first screenwriter was Arkoff, something Arkoff. Anyway, he was one of the guys that worked for American International Pictures, and he did a bunch of other films, like that really cool Danish science fiction film, Journey to the Seventh Planet. He wrote the screenplay for that. He wrote the screenplay for The Angry Red Planet in the late 50s. <laughs> so the guy had a resume, and Bava had read the story originally, so the idea of doing this film came from him. But he wasn't a screenwriter, so first it went to this American guy, and then it went to another couple of Italian guys, and then it went to a Spaniard, and then it went, you know, somewhere else. And so by the time it was finished, it had gone through a lot of different drafts, and a lot of the original idea was changed quite a bit. So I think Baba had intended, actually, to stick a little bit more to this idea in the story of, like, making the possession seem kind of like a good thing for these people. I think that, that mm -hmm. looks like that was almost more of his original intent. And that got a little bit lost all along the way. But he did comment right away on getting the first draft that the screenwriter really understood how to make things eventful. And, like, yeah, he took the basic blueprint of the story and created all these events around it and made it exciting and added an alien spaceship so that Bava could really go to town on cool sets and everything yeah. like that. And they knew what he was good at. Yeah. So yeah, it'd definitely be interesting to see earlier versions of the script if any exist. Yeah. yeah a lot of this is documented pretty clearly in the uh, all the colors of the dark book, but right. I don't know about the actual scripts. Yeah. Mm. But yeah, I'm gonna get into the story because yeah. it is very short, so there won't be a long discussion afterwards. So I just want to leave the rest of the talking till we're, we finish the story and then we can <laughs> discuss it. But.
On the surface of a gray, barren, desert planet, two ships have come to rest. One rather violently. This is the big science vessel Orion. The two were investigating the planet when the Orion experienced some kind of engine failure and smashed brutally into the world. Its smaller sister ship, the Vega, has come down, landing safely. But the two ships need one another to complete their mission and return home safely. Unfortunately, the Orion is completely wrecked, and there are no survivors. Crewman Dudley Houston talks to Captain Weaver as they sit glumly in the Vega. Dudley is upset that his brother Peter was on the Orion, and they all seem to have been a close-knit group of people. The captain says they will miss all of them. It seems unlikely that the Vega will be able to get back home. I don't know what the mothership is required for exactly, fuel maybe, or navigation or something, but it certainly seems like the two of them in close proximity is part of the setup, and they need each other. So there's a cool reflection where Renato talks about all the various expeditions that have been lost already, and he describes the haunting experience, like, secondhand, basically, through recordings that are picked up of weird noises and screams of agony or slow lingering death. And there are many hostile environments out there in the void. The story is quite atmospheric, describing night on the alien world with the three moons rising. And the men are, of course, troubled, and Captain Weaver reflects, Millions of years have passed since man appeared. He subjugated his home planet. He spread throughout the solar system. By now, he has adapted himself to space. He has shaped itself according to its incredible laws, and he has pushed himself toward other planetary systems. Millions of years have passed, and with his ingenuity, man has dominated the known universe so far. But it is enough to leave this man in an abandoned house, alone at night, and he will find himself completely defenseless from the assault of invisible enemies against whom he will have no weapons to defend himself. The fear of the unknown, of what sometimes he himself creates and unintentionally distorts under these circumstances, of the darkness that can hide anything. And Tim Lucas, the writer of All the Colors of the Dark, speculates that it's this specific passage that made Baba go, well, I could make this movie. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's kind of interesting, but and, and cool. I really like that. Pastor Nero definitely does understand how to create the, the horror atmosphere here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They start, finally start pulling out the bodies from the wreckage. And they're all mangled and mutilated and crushed. And not much equipment survived either. They bury the bodies with makeshift steel crosses. Captain Weaver is determined to still carry out some research on the planet and try to get home in one piece. The men are skeptical about their chances, but Weaver insists on still doing everything by the book, and that includes having a guard rotation during the night. The night here lasts 21 hours, which he divides into four shifts. Crewman Lori Anderson loses his cool and starts to panic, but Weaver is stern and square-jawed. Dudley Houston Sounds like he should be the square-jawed guy, but he's not, so... (laughs) But he's the first to do sentry duty, while the others file into the ship for some rest. Dudley sits tiredly as the fog coalesces all around him, and he's a bit spooked, and he ruminates on how much more unsettling the darkness is. Meanwhile, three of the four remaining crew sleep in the Vega, while Captain Weaver stands in a corner, smoking and brooding. And yeah, smoking on your spaceship. <laughs> <laughs> well, the rockets are off now, I guess. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's considering trying to go back to sleep when something catches his attention. It's Crewman Anderson who gets out of his bunk with a happy smile on his face and walks with his eyes closed to the navigation room. What the hell is going on? Sleepwalkers aren't allowed to be astronauts. It must be something else. And Pat Weaver follows the man. And 
this Anderson seats in his control seat and appears to be experiencing some pain. The tickled, childish expression keeps returning to his face, though, and Weaver's going to bring the man to lucidity when he hears something in the corridor. It's crewman Epp Doyle stalking into the room with a weird expression and his eyes closed. And he grabs a wrench and starts smashing the ship's radio, which of course is the first thing any alien invader would like to do. But this spurs Weaver into action, and he starts shaking the two men and shouting at them. And Doyle is so shocked that he instantly faints. As for Cliff Donovan, he seems okay. Maybe he didn't get any sleep. And he talks to Laurie Anderson, who is very ashamed. And he says it was like someone else was in his head, only he knew that it was also himself the whole time. Above him, the sky turns a strange red color. It's just one of the moons rising. So those two are outside, and now, of course, we need at least two on guard. Eb, Dudley, and Pat sit in the ship drinking black coffee, and Dudley confines that while he was on shift, he saw shadows creeping through the fog and heard distinct rustling noises. And he put it down to the spooks and wouldn't have even said anything were it not for other weird stuff going on this night. One of the shadows looked like his brother. And just then the radio comes to life. The dead men are up and about. It's not just the walking dead. These men are so damaged in body with caved in chests and stoved in heads and mangled limbs and blood everywhere. But they all seem inordinately happy and pleased with themselves. It's the formerly calm Cliff screaming into the microphone. And Lori is nowhere to be found. And Cliff is running to the ship for safety. So Pat decides they should go and try to get Lori, wherever he is, and they find the five graves of their comrades, of course, open. And Cliff and Dudley vanish next. So now there's only Pat and Eb Doyle left, and they heard shooting in the night. Doyle is completely sure that Cliff and Dudley are dead. Their suits aren't transmitting anymore. And then Doyle sobs out, Look! Over there! Over there! All the dead men have come out to party. And Dudley and Cliff are indeed among them, both with fatal gunshot wounds. And they are sporting and cavorting about, all playing and laughing like children. And Pat has a theory. Something on this planet is affecting them. And it only works at night when people sleep, or when they're no longer alive in the conventional conscious sense. And they are taken over by the childish, innocent, but sometimes quite dangerous it. So there's no alien possession here anywhere. Just the childish desire to break toys to see what they look like inside. Which is something that I knew very, very well when I was a kid. So <laughs> I get it completely. I'd be the one smashing that radio, which I actually yeah. do remember doing at some point. Having a little radio and splashing it to bits to see what the inside was like. So, <laughs> but people on this planet can never die, it seems, no matter how damaged their bodies are. And Pat says quietly, at least perhaps unwittingly, they are happy. Envy them. At 1823, since the harrowing night began, the remaining two are exhausted, and Pat keeps dozing off. Once when he wakes up, he's alone, and the room is a total mess. Seems Doyle got the bug, and he had fun throwing papers and stuff everywhere, and now there's no sign of him. Now that he's alone, Captain Pat Weaver finally seems to break, and he moans and asks why he should be the last. Why? Because he's captain, of course, but he won't be saving this ship. At twenty hundred hours, the captain goes out, walking toward the Orion, where he can hear the sound of raucous singing. The kids are there, hopping and skipping around, and having an awesome time. Pat longs to join them, and the children seem to welcome him, but his conscience won't let him. So, he makes sure his gun is loaded. Wait, friends, he said. One more moment, and I'll join you. The very white sun was about to rise from the gray line of the horizon. The nocturnal vapors had almost completely disappeared. 
the sky had lost its clusters of stars. A shot broke the silence and propagated across the plain. Festive shouts rose from the group as they began to dance around Pat's body again. That's how the story ends. Yeah. And it's haunting, but oddly liberating? Hopeful? I yeah. don't know. It's yeah. creepy, but not sinister. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And Pester Nero did comment that he meant for you to feel like they were better now, almost. Yeah. Mm. So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's definitely a bit creepy. And yeah, I mean, these kids are so excited that they're, like, firing their guns off randomly and stuff like that. <laughs> like, maybe they didn't even mean to shoot Dudley at what's-his-face. But <laughs> they, they're just having fun. <laughs> so... And if you have a hole in your forehead, you stay with them forever. Yeah, it seems that way, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, this was cool. And again, a nice contrast to the film, which I guess we'll get into a little bit, but it seems that whatever is causing this state of mind is implied to be more natural phenomenon of the planet rather than some kind of malicious entity. Malignant alien, mm -hmm. yeah. So it's an interesting take on it. Again, the separation between the id and the ego causing this childlike behavior to make one feel like what isn't in one's own body but just kind of acting out out of some childhood impulse that you can't control yeah 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 i thought it was an interesting take and quite different from the film yeah i definitely feel like forbidden planet was a pretty strong influence on this yeah pester nero says mm -hmm. that he hadn't seen forbidden planet or read who goes there yeah they always say things. They'd like always, that. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean... It could be true. It could be yeah. true. Yeah. yeah. I mean... We can't confirm or deny it. Right. Yeah. And I mean, there were older science fiction stories in the pulp, like a lot of things in Astounding, for instance, that we'll be getting to soon enough, that had these kind of scenarios. And usually the stories in Astounding end more hopefully, I think, especially after Campbell took over, although... He wasn't averse to mood pieces either, and he wrote a few of them himself, which are kind of, like, a bit on the melancholy side. And like, again, seems to be a theme uh, tonight, actually, where you get to see stories of the end of civilization, and right. the end of humanity as we know it. And, like, I guess this is kind of that. Like, imagine if whatever was on the planet was transmissible. And none of these people are going to get away, so I guess they're just going to dance and have cavorting fun forever. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah. Also, interestingly, though, it reminded me of 2001 as well, and the end of that movie, where Dave comes into contact with the monolith at last, and he becomes the new star child, and, like, right. it's like, I think it's a line in a, it might be in the book or something like that, and he's, like, talking about the universe and how it's spread out before him, and, and it's like, what a wonderful place to play, and, you know, and, like, that's kind of what this reminded me of, too. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. The names were kind of funny. Yeah, they're absolutely great <laughs> Italian <laughs> approximations of English names, yeah. <laughs> it seems typical of, I mean, we, we saw that in a Russian story recently, too. Yeah. That, yeah. You know, these kind of funny... What is it, Jim and Tim? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just like Nisol and Gisol, you get them confused. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's kind of funny because in this story, I guess, you know, you can pretty much assume that the characters come from Earth, but... When we get to the film, like, I mean, well, we're kind of, we've been talking about it this whole time, but, like, the characters are, there's a twist at the end, and the, it turns out the characters are not supposed to be from Earth. But yeah. they also have very, um, it's not quite as bad, like, the, they sound a little bit more, like, not just exclusively Anglo, but it's still kind of like that. And they use very common terminology like somebody referring to swiss cheese at the beginning of the film to discuss like what their ship would look like if meteors hit it and stuff like that and it just seems very like you you really feel like you're supposed to believe that they're from earth and and when it turns out they're not i, I feel like it doesn't quite come off as well as it should just because it's not i don't know and, and i guess again it's a contrast with the visual side of things though because unlike a nero planet of the vampires film does look pretty otherworldly and like not necessarily of its time although i guess crazy designs were maybe more common in the 60s yeah i don't know i, I think in, in some way i mean it's definitely of its time yeah 
it's one of my favorite science fiction movies of all time and it definitely looks amazing but it's yeah. definitely has a 60s low budget feel and that right. some of the special effects for like the spaceship landing or something like that is what you'd see on original star trek and mm -hmm. i think we mentioned forbidden planet not too long ago some of the set design definitely looked like it took some influence of Forbidden Planet in the spaceship and how, like, the control room is constructed. And you see similar sets not too far off in some Doctor Who episodes, but yeah. Baba just has such a great feel for colors and camera movement and shot positioning. I think one of the quotes from the All the Colors of the Dark book is that Baba positioned his actors more like set pieces and background decorations rather than characters that were supposed to interact with one another because he yeah. shot these films with a multi-lingual cast of people who were from all over the world. The lead actress in this is Brazilian. He's working with various Spanish, Italian, German, in addition to the American and British actors he had in and out of his films. So they yeah. would say all their lines in whatever language and then everything would be just dubbed over in post mm -hmm. and kind of lends it a weird feel in all the languages that it's produced for. So this one I've seen cuts in English, Italian, and German. I typically watch it in, in Italian, but I mean, there's not like mm -hmm. the original cast was speaking Italian. That's kind of an no. odd pastiche. Yeah. There are some interview clips from the, uh, or quotes, I should say, from a couple of the American AIP people in All the Colors of the Dark, where they talk about that, and one of them, I can't remember who it is, it might be Arkoff, might be somebody else, but he basically talks about the process of making those kind of genre movies in Italy, mm -hmm. and probably in Spain too, but especially in Italy, where, yeah, like, there's not a lot of communication on set. Nobody really understands each other. <laughs> and so like everybody speaks a different language and they're sort of able to roughly figure things out, but like you can't really go to anybody and be like, Hey, what's my motivation? Like Right. <laughs> that stuff just doesn't work and Yeah. It's kind of funny because Argento especially has the reputation Dario Argento that is, he has a reputation for not liking actors very much. Like this doesn't really like telling them what to do or communicating with them very much and it's almost like yeah they're more like props <laughs> yeah than sometimes and he gets kind of annoyed if people ask him too many questions and stuff like that Bubba seems like he was a pretty nice guy to work with for the most part and the american guys said when they came over and they looked at what was happening and it was like they were really impressed and they saw the film and they were really impressed but Arkov also said, he's like, it was a crazy way to make movies, <laughs> yeah. and they'll never be made that way again. Yeah, right. Like, that's pretty much what he said. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Bava pretty much was the Italian film industry for a while. He just did so much stuff on the sets of so many movies, and I think he pretty much learned the entire production from the ground up. And he's most known for his horror stuff, and he did a lot of that stuff in the 60s and 70s. But he also did a fair amount of non-horror films too. Yeah. There's a couple sword and sorcery movies. There's a couple comedies, which are by accounts terrible. I think Danger Diabolic kind of counts as yeah. a Oh, yeah. No, that, that's, that's, a great that's great. Yeah. yeah, I was about yeah. to bring that one up. Yeah. yeah. But he has a real talent for the camera and how to move it around and how to construct interesting looking shots in mm -hmm. ways that I think exceed even Argento and Fulci, and Fulci in particular, some of the camera work is just kind of amateurish in mm. comparison. But Planet of the Vampires has just some incredible, incredible shots in it. The alien derelict scene, which was added for the film and doesn't appear in the story at all, is probably my favorite science fiction scene of any film. Yeah, it's really awesome. Yeah, the, the way it's put together is just incredible. Yeah, and I guess if you haven't seen the film, you should definitely watch it before listening us to us talk about some of the finer details of it because it's just a great experience and <laughs> it has a lot going for it that adds on top of the story that I guess was the process of it going through several different revisions during the script writing process. Yeah, Pestronero said he liked the film. He certainly seems happy that it's considered like maybe one of the very top Italian science fiction films. 
I don't know. I think he's a little bit detached about it, maybe because he doesn't see that much of his original story in it. Right. Mm-hmm. And he only got paid $125. <laughs> yeah. <so>. yeah. <laughs> I feel yeah. like one of those reasons might be a little more prominent than the other. Probably, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But he seems to acknowledge that it's a really good film, and he kind of expresses a little bit of regret that he never got to meet Mario Baba. But yeah, he just couldn't, couldn't, you know, make the trip, so it didn't happen. I don't know, it's not the first or the last time. I mean, uh, ten years later, Francis Ford Coppola would buy The Godfather from Mario Puzo for very little money as well. So right. I, I think it was more than 125 bucks, but it was like <laughs> 450 or something like that. It's probably less than he made <laughs> considering, off. Yeah, considering what uh, like well-regarded classic film it is, right? right. He probably deserve a little more, but what can you do? <laughs> yeah. But now this one yeah. does maintain more or less the same setting of the story of the weird, mysterious planet covered in fog and the general maroonment of the two attached ships, though this one they're drawn by a malignant force and mm-hmm. not just kind of the natural circumstances of a weird planet that they happen to stumble upon from some scientific expedition. Yeah. And the unfolding of how they, I guess, discover this and the malignant alien presence that's possessing them to attack each other and destroy their equipment and stuff like that is also what generates the conflict between the two groups of characters, the dead people and the people that are still left alive, which does make it a little bit more exciting from a film viewing experience. But again, it's a different take on the source material. It emphasizes different aspects of the scenario. Yeah. I mean, I think in a way it does kind of bring it more into line with what you expect from a science fiction yeah. film. Mm. But it's not a bad thing. I like those kind of plots, right? So the alien possession is cool. I like yeah. that. Okay. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. But these children are cool too. I mean, I again, this is very, it's very nightmarish. And I guess I can see how if it hadn't gone on longer, it probably wouldn't have been as good. Wouldn't have been as effective. Yeah. Mm. Mostly, yeah, he's kind of dry and a little bit like Pat sat down and drank his coffee and did this. But every so often, he'll really get uh, existential with stuff. And there's some really cool moments in the story where, yeah, like when he's talking about the eerie reports that came back from the planets where the expeditions didn't return from. And the captain thinking about how easy it is for someone to basically succumb to this dread in the darkness and the other guy on watch hiding his experiences of what he saw because it was too unbelievable but then in the face of everything else that's going on well maybe it's worth <laughs> worth going into right and i don't know it's just there's some there's definitely definitely some cool moments of psychology to be found in the story that aren't really in the film right so yeah again i think that's an advantage that stories sometimes do have over film is it it's, I mean, you can convey these kind of things in both, but sometimes it's easier to write about somebody's psychological state than to show it. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. yeah. So, and yeah, the characters, the actors in the film probably didn't have a huge idea of what was going on, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, some of them did redub their lines. The captain, Barry, what's his name? Barry Sullivan. Yeah. Uh, that was all his voice. And, uh, he was probably the only one, actually, come to think of it, in the English dub. Yeah, Because uh, so. there weren't any other English performers in the cast. So, yeah, or English-speaking, I should say. But really cool, interesting development, because I had no idea that Planet of the Vampires was based on a story. And it's not the first time that that's happened. And I always, when I like a film, I'm always like, oh, I want to read the, the original source material and mm-hmm. see what it's like. This is kind of an ideal situation where the story is really short, so the movie has all the chance in the world to build on it, whatever it wants, right? Right. And I think they're great companion pieces to each other for that exact reason. They focus on different stuff, but they complement each other very, very well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the film is great as a film, and the story is great as a story. There's the aspects of both that make it perfect for their own medium. Yeah. I do like the slightly more diverse cast in the film 
like of the characters. I mean, there's, yeah, there's a couple women, women characters and <laughs> yes. different. Yeah, about the names again is just kind of funny because I was just reminded of something. I might have mentioned this before, but so I mean, I talked a bit about the '60s Italian space opera films, and I really like them. They really have a character to them. I like those Gamma One films from Antonio Margheriti. I think they're really good. In the seventies, some of them got kind of bad, and I think it was. I mean, I don't mind Star Wars. Like, I enjoy the first trilogy of films a fair bit. But there's no denying that perhaps there were some unfortunate consequences of that in film. And I think that oh, maybe... Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think I think the science fiction films that were blockbusters after that were not as... I don't know. They, they weren't as creative sometimes as the ones from, like, ten years before. And even though, like, some of the... 60s Italian films were pretty silly. The 70s ones, all, a lot of the time, the later 70s ones, when there was just kind of the second boom of science fiction films in Italy where a bunch of films were made, they were all kind of rip-offs of Star Wars. And I was just kind of thinking of one done by Aldo Lado, who's the guy that made a couple of really awesome movies, like Short Night of the Glass Dolls. And he made this movie called The Humanoid. And... It's kind of interesting. It's It's got some definitely original weird touches to it and a pretty cool cast and all that. But it includes Richard Kyler, who's most known as Jaws, the henchman in a couple of the James Bond movies. Mm, right, yeah. <laughs> He's this really big, gaunt kind of guy, I guess. He's kind of like the hero of the film, but there's this kind of interesting, funny contrast with the names that really makes me laugh in that in Star Wars, right? We watch Star Wars, and we know that it's in a galaxy far, far away long ago, right? Because it says so right in the beginning. And so when we hear that Princess Leia of Alderaan has the plans for the Death Star, we're like, oh, yeah, who's Princess Leia of Alderaan? We want to know her. So in the humanoid, the bad guy is looking for a woman who is like the Princess Leia substitute. And I forget exactly why and she's got something or she knows something or she has some power or secret knowledge or something you think you know being italian they'd come up with some cool name for her that kind of rolls off the tongue but the name of the character is barbara gibson and so in the movie in the galaxy far far away long ago they're like we must find barbara gibson and yeah. it just sounds so weird <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Some of those Italian movies from that era are fun. I've seen a bunch that are knockoffs of The Road Warrior and Mad Max. And no. the movie Contamination is a pretty shameless ripoff of Alien. So, yeah, I've seen that one, but yeah. not the Mad Max ripoffs. Yeah. There's some really good ones. Warriors of the Wasteland and 2019 After the Fall of New York. Yeah, I've heard about that one, yeah. but not the first one. Yeah, some pretty ridiculous stuff. But yeah, a lot of fun. I, I enjoy the Z-grade trash as, as much as cool. some of the more seriously well done films yeah i think i want to watch the galaxy criminals also known as wild wild planet again sometimes <laughs> that's a favorite of mine yeah that's crazy crazy film definitely i guess less stylish probably than baba but in its way i think pretty creative and, and cool and yeah the well the colors of the dark book does mention him a lot as pretty much keeping the science fiction boom going in the 60s and Italy and kind of like not necessarily being the first because I think Baba was actually the first with an earlier film that I, I haven't seen from 1958. Yeah, he did a bunch of camera work for like, again, a billion Italian movies in the 50s, including some early science fiction, including some early horror, uh, probably a bunch of Westerns too. Yeah, but in 1958, there's this film, The Death of... Uh, I don't remember. I just I saw the Italian title, but not yeah. a translation. But it's like a, supposed to be one of the earliest, like of its type, and it's done in a kind of documentarian style, and it's set mostly on Earth, but it's like a, a space disaster kind of story or something like that. Right, and right. I haven't seen that. I, I don't know too much about that. But, so I, I thought Planet of the Vampires was his only pure science fiction film, but apparently not. But yeah, this one's up on the blog spot, and yes. I just gave away the whole story and I think <laughs> summarized it in a way that kind of brings across the feeling of it pretty well, but I really like this. I, I'd love to read more Pestro Nero someday. Mm. Not necessarily for the podcast, but just in general. Can't find much in English. No, it so. seems like a couple other things have been translated, but certainly nowhere near 
half of his work or even a quarter, I don't think. Yeah. That's unfortunate. Yeah. yeah. It really is. I mean, yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe he oversells his advanced way of looking at things in terms of other genre writers, but he wouldn't be the only writer to do that. No, you know what I mean? Like, and other writers do that all the time. Yeah. They're like, I'm, I'm more... I'm more psychological and sophisticated than those other guys. Yeah. <laughs> I'm more literary. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I don't really blame him. Like, why shouldn't you? You should feel that way about your work, right? Even if you don't have to necessarily spend all your days reading all the magazines to look for the gems, right? We can do that now more easily in retrospect. Yep. And we do. And we're going to. <laughs> Speaking of that, unless you guys have anything else to add, we can actually get into that. No, I'm good. How about you, Gretchen? Yeah, yeah I'm ready. All right, yeah. What do we got for next time? So, next time on Chrononauts, we've been talking a fair bit in hints and in more than hints about a certain time period and a certain magazine from the United States that was quite widely read called Astounding Stories of Super Science. Or Astounding Stories. Or Astounding Science Fiction. Or Analog. Depending on what era you're looking at, really. We're actually looking at doing two episodes, not quite concurrently, but somewhat with one in between, probably, dealing with the days of this magazine. Not looking too far into the beyond the 1930s yet. Well, I'm sure we'll get there later on and probably even just discussing individual stories as they come maybe not specifically focused on the magazine but these two episodes are going to be and we're going to start with the next one and this will be focused on the earlier days of the magazine so this is before the time when we were referring to especially in our discussion of less darkness fall by de Camp, where we mostly talked about unknown and how it was tied in with astounding and that necessitated a lot of discussion about John Campbell and his editorship of Astounding, which really started in 1939. So the magazine changed hands a couple of times before then, and we're going to be talking about the somewhat early days, and we have six stories coming up for you all, and I think this is going to be really interesting. So I'm going to take these in chronological order. We'll start with The Cave of Horror by S.P. Meek from the January 1930 issue. I believe that was the first issue of the magazine. Yep. Yes. Okay. Perfect. And we're following that up with Sophie Wendell Ellis and her story, Creatures of the Light, which is from the February 1930 issue. Popular author, and I guess if you can say, you know, some of these 1930s authors, they're not very well known now. They're not exactly household names. But this guy's kind of close. Murray Leinster and his story, Sideways in Time from June 1934. We also have Raymond Zinke Galoon and his Old Faithful from December 1934. Harry Bates, who I believe was the original editor of the magazine, and Alas, All Thinking from June 1935. And finally, finishing it off, John W. Campbell and his story, Who Goes There? from August 1938, where we will once again talk about film adaptations. Yeah. Maybe several of them, in fact. Yes. <laughs> For now, though, I'm detecting a disturbance in the third weeb, and I think I have to check on the tensor waves. It might be time to switch off the Mima and try to get into the hard work of some real sleep using my caveman slave to tie me to the bedpost so I don't turn into a somnambulistic child and wreck my apartment while I'm sleeping. I don't know how you guys are going to handle it, but I wish you good luck. And all you listeners, I also wish you good luck. Don't worry about the shadows in the fog. It's just your dreams of childhood. We are chrononauts. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>